Tonight, we're going to talk about relativism now. Relativism is a big subject. Relativity. I call it relativity, I think. Relativity, relativity, relativism. It's a big subject, and I want to make a few comments about certain applications. Um, it's incomplete, both in depth and in scope, but I think that there's, there's so much uh, misinformation about it that clearing up some of it will be, will be helpful. That was my hope. And I uh, intend to speak about truth, science, and ethics. <clears throat> now let me start with science. It's, a, it's narrower and it's simpler in a way even than truth. Um, it was a period of time, 30s and 40s, when it was popular to say, Einstein has proved that everything is relative. After all, he created relativity theory. He celebrated it. It's a gigantic discovery. Everybody's impressed with it. Nobody dares to disagree with it. And it's the theory that everything is relative. So how could they argue with Einstein? Man, that's about as wrong as it could possibly get. First of all, it's a theory in physics that had nothing to do with Shakespeare interpretation or, or, or microbiotic cooking or some of the, uh, or any, any ethical issues. Number two, it's the opposite of what Einstein discovered. It's the opposite of what he meant. He discovered that measurements of time and space are relative to the inertial frame of the person doing the measuring. And therefore, he said, that's not the subject of science. The subject of, that is relative. Measurements of time and space are uh, relative to the frame of the observer and to be different for different observers. Science ought to be studying what isn't relative. That's why space-time is so important, because measurements in space-time aren't relative to the observer. They are universal and objective and absolute. And as Alexander Friedman said, space and time are destined to fade away and to be replaced by space-time because space-time is objective. And indeed, Einstein's own name for his theory was not relativity. It was invariant theory because you should study the things that don't vary, namely space-time. Everybody got this entirely wrong. So it's wrong even in physics. And it's certainly wrong even, and it's wrong to apply it outside of physics. So certainly Einstein did not discover that everything's relative. Even a little more subtle, a little more tricky, people will tell you, well, motion is relative. Motion is relative. Well, let's see. If I tell you that X is moving, you have a right to ask, moving with respect to what? Am I moving right now? Well, not with respect to this table, but I am with respect to the sun. To say moving is to say something incomplete. To make a full statement out of it, you've got to say moving with respect to something else. Now, that means motion is relative. Okay, does that mean that Motion is somehow subjective, not real, not factual, up for grabs. You can say whatever you want. Nobody ever makes a mistake. It's all a matter of emotion. Is that what it means to say that motion is relative? I don't think so. What it means is that until you tell me with respect to what you're measuring the motion, you haven't said anything. You haven't said anything. Not you should said something and then it falls apart in being subjective and then without standards and so forth and so on. You just haven't said anything. Moving in this respect is like taller. Suppose I say John is taller. You'll say taller than what? Because taller by itself doesn't say anything at all. That's subjective and without standards. You can say what you like and nobody can convince me to a mistake. You haven't said anything. It's a relative concept. What you do with relative concepts is you fill in what it's related to, and then you get a statement of real fact. I am moving with respect to the sun is really true, objectively true, universally true. You can't contradict it. You can't play with it. You can't say it's up to me to decide. That's a fact. I'm not moving with respect to the table. I mean, say moving without filling in. You haven't said anything at all. This doesn't lead to 
everybody has his own uh, view and everybody has his own opinion and nobody can say what's right and wrong and nobody can tell anybody what to think. It just means fill in the statement that you have to make it into a statement that says something about the world and then it will be objective and universal and true and so, on and so forth and so on. Now what happens when uh, people do a really deep analysis is this. Imagine having a, a list of facts of taller than for all the people in the world, every pair of people who's taller than who. Well, there are eight billion people in the world, so this is gonna be very long, right? Um, we don't store the information that way. We don't store the information by having a pairwise description for each pair of people who's taller than who. We create something called your height, which is a number. Each person gets a number, and then when you have any two, pair, any two people and you want to compare them, you compare the numbers. We tell you that the height is the, is the objective reality, and the comparison is read from the objective reality. So Toledan is also objective, but you, the fact that Toledan is built out of is how tall each person is. Same thing is true with relativity. When you make a measure of space-time, you can then predict what the measurement for each observer will be in his frame from the one, fe one feature of, of space-time. So the, the relative measurements that people make in their, in their own frames are factual, but everyone's is different. So, but if he's making a measurement for himself in his frame, that is in fact how it measures it for him in his frame. It's just that other people will be measuring from different frames. So they won't be agreeing with their, 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 their judgments. Each one could say, I know what you're doing, I know what frame you're in, and how it looks to you, and this is my frame, and this is how it looks to me. But there's one thing that determines all of them, and that's the, the features of space-time. So none of this should lead to, as everything's up for grabs and there are no standards. That's in science, certainly not in science. Now, when you come to truth, you do hear people talk like this. There's only his truth, her truth, their truth, the truth uh, of, the, of the group. Beyond that, there's nothing. That means there's no objective truth, nothing that's true independently of how people think about it, their opinions about it. There's only what truths people recognize and what they commit themselves to. That's all there is, nothing beyond that. I think that's a non-starter. A non-starter. I think it's it's absolutely untenable. And I'll give you three quick reasons why that is. I'm happy to discuss them for a little while afterwards. Uh, I I think that they. Uh, and by the way, I was once uh, about 15 years ago. I went to speak at UCLA. And on the way over, the, uh, the person who invited me said, "By the way, I just want to let you know, the students there don't believe in truth." <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So it's, I took a 15-minute introduction and explained to them why the, their rejection of truth was a mistake. They were like hypnotized. No one had ever broached the subject before. It's a forbidden subject on university to talk about truth. A couple had good questions, and I was able to answer them, and they walked out like... They did listen to the other things I said, but still, that was like... Okay, so here we go. I'm going to interview someone who believes that truth is relative in this sense. Here I'm stressing the negative. It's not universal. It's not objective. There's, not, it's, it's, there's nothing that's uh, correct or incorrect. There's only what you think and what you think and what you and they and so forth and so on. Um, so here's my first, my first question to the relativist. I have two friends, Peter and Paul. Peter belongs to a group, a culture, a society, I believe the Earth is round, and he, they therefore believe, they actually believe, that if you start at the equator and go due west, eventually you'll come round circle and come back to where you started. Paul belongs to a culture that believes the Earth is flat, and he believes that if you start at the equator and you walk due west, you'll fall off the edge. Now, I, I'm taking Peter and Paul on a trip, starting at the waiter, equator and going due west. Paul doesn't want to come, but I have a gun. So here we go. Peter, Paul, and I. Now, I ask you, a believer in relativity, believes there's no such thing as absolute, ob objective, et cetera, et cetera, truth, tell me what's going to happen. 
what's going to happen on this trip. If he says, well, listen, Peter comes from a society and, uh, that believes it. He believes that it's round and that you come back to the beginning. So he will come back to the beginning. And Paul, who believes that it's flat, he's going to fall off the edge. That's what's going to happen. One will go around and one will fall off the edge. If he says, that's what he says, I think it's time to, to, to conclude the discussion, tell him to go and have a beer and leave us alone. Right? <laughs> right. But now if he says they're both going to come back to the beginning, I want to know why he preferred Peter and Peter's society's truth over Paul and Paul's society's truth. Why is it that he uses one to make the prediction and the other not? If there's nothing more than this is what they believe in and this is what they believe in, this is what they're committed to, this is what they're committed to, this is what they accept, this is what they accept, how is it that one works for the prediction and the other one doesn't? I don't think he has an answer to that question. That's one question for the relativist. Second question for the relativist is, sometimes people change their minds. Not often enough, but they do sometimes. And sometimes they change their minds because they used to think one thing, and then experience has taught them that maybe it would be better to believe something else. Now, there are lots of reasons why it might be better. Other people will give you credit for it. You'll get more likes on your Facebook account, and so forth and so on. But sometimes, Experiences teach, teach them that the world doesn't seem to work the way the first belief said, and it does work the way the second belief said, or it's better, a better approximation, and they trade it in. Now, if there's only my truth, your truth, his truth, her truth, their truth, when I believed the first one, that was my truth. Now that I've changed my mind, the new one is my truth. How could one be better than the other? All we have is a claim to fame is it's mine. The old one was mine, and the new one is mine. What could possibly motivate me to move from one to the other when all I'm going to do is go from one thing that's mine to another thing that's mine? How am I making progress if all there is is what's mine? Nothing else to talk about. Clearly, it seems, I'm motivated by the thought that something's going to go better because I have it. Not just my social acceptance, uh, you know, my social credit. I don't think that that believer in relativity can, can handle it. I don't think he has any answer to that. And then, a s only slightly more sophisticated question. 20th century, one of its famous gambits is to take a rule, an idea, a law, a principle, which tells you something about how things work, and apply it back on itself and see what results you get. If it's a general principle which explains how things work, and the principle is part of one of the things in the world, it's fair to ask how it works, how it comes out when you apply it back on itself. Here's a simple example which was, is used to illustrate the idea. You'll hear people say, all rules have exceptions. Nobody gets it really right. Nobody gets it 100% right. You know, those things you didn't think of. You know, all rules have exceptions. OK, that's a four-worded rule, isn't it? All rules have exceptions is a rule. OK, let's try to take that rule, the rule that all rules have exceptions, and ask, is that rule also have an exception or not? Well, let's see. What are we supposed to say now? If it's really what I'm saying, all rules of exception, and that's a rule, then it, too, should have an exception. Now, what would an exception to all rules of exceptions be? What would an exception to that be? It would be a rule that has no exceptions. So that means all rules have exceptions implies there must be a rule that doesn't have exceptions, which means this rule implies that it's not true, which isn't a good position for a rule to be in. If the rule is true, it can't be true because it has, it, it has an exception. So that's one of the things you get when you, you know, apply things to themselves. You get uh, interesting outcomes. So now let's try that with the relativist. 
relativist is at least is making a a a um, negative um, a negative. Nothing is objective, uh, absolute, nothing. Well, nothing is objective. Three words. That's a statement. Am I supposed to apply the nothing is objective to the statement that nothing is objective or not? Nothing is objective. It's a thing. It's a rule. It's a principle. <laughs> Does it apply to itself or doesn't it? Now here, I think there are two possible answers, but I think neither of them is, is really adequate. You could say, um, yes, I'm going to be consistent, and I'm going to apply it across the board, and even that pronouncement that nothing is objective, even that, isn't objective. You could say that. I don't think there's a logical trap here. I think there is a dialectical trap here. People who say nothing's objective, why do they say that? What are they doing? What's their project? Well, their project is to attack people who have positive beliefs. People who think they're describing reality. To say to them, you know, you're making some terrible mistake. You're imperialists. They're cultural imperialists. But now, if they logically, consistently apply nothing is objective to nothing is objective, then saying nothing is objective is just your non-objective opinion about things or your non-objective feeling about things. They have a different non-objective feeling about things. Their feeling is that some things are objective. Why are you complaining about them? Why are you attacking them? Why are you questioning their morals? Their commitment to their being objective truths is no more solid, no more qualified, no more valid than your commitment to their not being. Because nothing's objective. So why are you attacking them? I think it, de it, it deprives them of their dialectical position of moral superiority and uh, moral outrage to say that you have, you're doing something which is somehow criticizable. Why? You took yours and they took theirs. If you tell me, no, 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 let's not be too um, uh, exaggerated here. Of course, it's, a, it's, it's an observation about the way the world works that no, um, nothing is objective except what I just told you, because that's an observation of how the world works, right? So then it comes out that this person is really saying, well, nothing's objective except what I'm telling you. <laughs> what I'm telling you is objective. Nothing else is objective. At that point, I think we have to ask him, what possible reason could you have to think that everything else isn't objective and only your position is objective? If a person is against objectivity as a phony concept, a phony idea, that's got to apply across the board. It can't be an exception. He says, yeah, all your stuff is not objective, but mine is. Mine's OK. Mine, 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 mine wins. How are you going to explain what you mean by objective and how you would argue that yours is and everybody else's isn't? I think that's a hopeless task. No one has ever tried it. No one's ever succeeded. So I think that applying nothing as objective to itself leads to a dilemma for such a person. Neither answer is going to be satisfactory for him. Now, these are three straightforward, simple challenges to people who think that, that truth is relative. I think it's hopeless. I, I don't think there's any sensible uh, response to, to any of these challenges. And if I think I'm, I'm, challenge, I'm, I'm challenging the idea directly, I think it's, it's uh, beyond, beyond uh, taking seriously. And by the way, the students at UCLA, I know they, they, well, of course, they wouldn't dare express these ideas to other professors. They'd be canceled and, you know, and thrown out. But uh, I think they uh, probably came to look at it differently. Uh, questions up to here. I mean, once the, 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 the response that brings him to a state in which he, you know, like, the only, the only solution is that he's 
completely authoritarian in terms of uh, like he's the one that he's the only one that knows like the future like like what's what's a uh, is, isn't it like a, like in what st status you you leave that person like okay you you already destroyed completely his I I say to him you need to describe you have you need to define objective so that I can yeah. see why it applies to you and nobody else yeah. and show me that that's and show me that's true you know the the the, the person who attacks objectivity usually is because he has a complaint against the concept as a whole. The concept is a bad concept. It doesn't apply well, we don't know how to apply with it right there. Or it's, it's incoherent in some way. But then there can't be exceptions. There can't be exceptions. I say sometimes yes and sometimes no. It's especially suspicious when he says mine yes and nobody else's, right? But, but leaving aside suspicions, right? It's, it's, it's the, the uh, uh, relativists or the nihilists that I know never take this position because they know it's a hopeless thing to explain that the concept's okay and really can work, work correctly, but only in this case and not other cases. It's very good. I think that's hopeless. Yeah. So um, when it comes to the truth, I, I could clearly see a distinction uh, of, of why the, 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 at least I could see, clearly see where the objective is to be correct in these instances. But in cases not necessarily just applying the truth, but they're just standards for, let's say, objects, like Sorty's paradoxes, and when does a grain of sand become a heap of sand? Those seem, at least, to be more intuitively subjective evaluations of, I am basing it off of you know, my subjective assessment of uh, whatever properties this thing has, which becomes something else, like, you know, uh, the property clusters or the type of fungal theory. These things seem to be not objective in, in calling one thing one category, another thing another category. Well, the, the uh, I took a particular case uh, on purpose because when we have a concept of truth, the concept of truth isn't perfectly clar clarified, isn't perfectly precise. Concept of truth, like many or perhaps all concepts, has a black, white, and gray area. But because it has a black, white, and gray area, we can understand what we mean when we ask whether something is true. We can even agree on where the gray areas are. So it's still, again, not up for somebody to say whatever he wants, you know. For me, it's true, and for you, it's not true, which is what the relativist wants to say. And there's no one to decide one way or the other. If someone says that 2 plus 2 is 4 is one of the gray areas, he's just wrong. It's not up for grabs. And the Sorthi's paradox, or, or uh, truth about present truths about future events, or uh, mathematical truths, or uh, unverifiable uh, truths, those are famous cases that have been studied in the history of philosophy and still, so are still being studied. It's very difficult to make up, make up our minds what to say about truth in those areas. Okay, but that's not an attack that's going to undermine the vast majority of things that we care about. And, and Can we say it's relative in those areas? Or we still have to hold it that it's objective in those areas? Well, re again, relative wouldn't mean that it's hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. Relative means it's an incomplete statement like taller. You haven't said anything unless you say taller than what? And once you fill in the then what, then it's perfectly objective. That's what relative means. But here, at the, at the sort of these progress isn't, isn't relative. You wouldn't know what to make it relative to to get an answer that would be objectively correct. That's part of one of the reasons why it becomes a, uh, a, a, gripping, a gripping problem. Right? It's, not, it's just I'm using my concepts, and here and I seem to have a, uh, a paradox that changing one can't change the outcome, and yet over time it does change the outcome, and I don't know what to say. There are paradoxes where you don't know what to say. What would you, what would you call a situation in which we say two people are, two people could be right on the matter, but they both have almost seemingly contradicting views? In other words, someone says a heap of sand starts here, and someone says no, it actually starts earlier. I would say that they're both, they're both, make, both making arbitrary judgments. Okay. I would ask them to justify it. Can you say that both are right on the matter? You wouldn't be able to. No, be I certainly wouldn't. Mm -hmm. What I would say is they're both making arbitrary judgments. They can't back them up in any way, mm -hmm. and therefore they have no right to say them. I say they're both, they're both wrong. <laughs> they're both right. Yeah. Uh, that can still apply the most depressing time of studying Hume. Um, so I feel like he would mutate with some of with, with some of these quite awfully. Like the combination of the kind of skepticism that he demonstrates. So for instance, showing that there's no way to connect various impressions, like finding no way to link, you know, in a billiard table, one ball hitting another ball to the next ball, and actually being able to associate those chains of effects. I feel like the kind of doubt that he creates 
then leaves room for a relativist to come in and say, because you can't really back up the connections between the impressions, um, basically anyone is free to engage in the custom of viewing things as they please. So in the first case... Oh, not at all. Okay. Not at all. Hume's argumentation arrives... I mean, there are 16 ways to understand Hume. Yeah. Right, let's leave that on the side of the moment. But his argumentation and causation leads to a, con a concrete conclusion. There is no way to link them. Mm -hmm. That's up to you to link them as you please. Not at all. There's a way to link the categories, right? The constant conjunction. Constant conjunction means this is what we find and our experience is, is, is accompanied by what? Beyond that, there's nothing else to say. In particular, there's no third element in the world that forces one to follow the other. And, and if you say there is, you're making a mistake. There isn't. He's not a relativist at all. He's got a philosophy that tells you what the truth is. He's skeptical about finding something extra, which other people, other people think they have found. And therefore, he wants to conclude that the other thing isn't there. And since it isn't there, then it isn't there. And there aren't connections. Now, then anybody can make any connections they want. Anybody who makes connections like that is wrong. I guess it would sort of be that they make those connections. Like, this is how they implement it as a tactic rather than as like a way to make it philosophically congruent. They would tactic to do what? A tactic to, on the one hand, try to disarm the people who might have a concrete sense of things. So they would you know, bring Hume sort of there. And then in the vacuum of that, because the other person wouldn't be able to say, well, now you've locked yourself into position not being able to say anything further, that person would kind of disarm. And they would just say, well, anyone's sort of free to do whatever they but want. But nobody says that. It's, it's, it's false, and, and it's dumb. It's, it's against the whole it's the argumentation. Argumentation is not to give a free, uh, a free ride to anybody who wants to say anything. Contrary, it's to tell people, if you say things and things like this, you're definitely wrong, because there's nothing behind it. You, his argument is an argument from, from it's a kind of um, uh, epistemological argument. There is no way to know the thing that you are talking about, and therefore you're always unjustified in talking about it. It's something that by, you know, his argument is it's not, it's not uh, logic, and it's not impressions, so, it's not, so there's no way to know it. There's no way to know it. It's always unjustified to talk about it. So how does a person like that live, then? You know, well, he himself said, when I step out of the, the <laughs> philosophy, then I play pool or billiards or snooker, you know, I, I go with the, with the things. So, you know, he talks about it mentally. It's over. But the idea that because there's no standard, you can say what you want. No, if there's no standard, you can't say anything. Mm -hmm. That's a concrete, definite conclusion. Yeah? Don't the relativists try to say, oh, the way you see the world is relative to your environment? So wouldn't the environment be similar to kind of your example of this 100% true. This is 100% true. The way you see the world is relative to your environment, and relative to your history, relative to the, your sense organs, and so forth and so on. That's the way you see the world. I'm talking about truth, not the way you see the world. So because there is no object, so they're saying there is no objective truth, so there, but there has to be an objective truth is what you're saying. The relativist would say there's no objective truth. The relativist can say it's hard to get to the truth. So the relativist can say we're all handicapped because we all have a partial picture. That's true. But if you say that you're handicapped in getting to the truth, if you say you should be cautious, be cautious because you might very well be making a mistake, those statements depend upon there being a truth. If you tell a person be cautious because you might be making a mistake, what do you mean by mistake? Mistake means not getting it right, not seeing it the way it really is, the true way that it is. To, to say you should be careful not to make a mistake means there's such a thing as a mistake, capital M, that's wrong, period. Not anybody can say what he likes. So the idea of being careful presumes that there is a truth and tells you be cautious in thinking that you have the truth. So it's not an attack on truth. It's an attack on your reliability in getting to the truth. So there I got lost now, but what do you mean by that? Sorry, I'm So I'm not hearing you. Huh? I'm not hearing you. Sorry, I got confused. Can you like repeat it? I got confused. <sighs> See if I can give you an example. Imagine you go to somebody in Saudi Arabia a thousand years ago. And you say to him, you're familiar with water, aren't you? He said, yes. Sometimes water is a solid. 
What? What is a solid? Are you nuts? <laughs> like, you know, I've been to the ocean, you know, and we have rivers and pools. What is never a solid? It's never a solid. What are you talking about? In other places, water is a solid. I think they, in those other places, they have cocaine or something else that they're smoking, <laughs> you know, and they, what is a solid? You've got to be joking. Well, because of his narrow experience, he's never been below freezing, never seen anything that's been below freezing, so he has no idea that water is, it can be a solid. Other places, like at the Arctic Circle, water is a solid, right? That means that his view, his thinking, his beliefs are um, inadequate. The world has things in it that he doesn't know, right? That's not an attack on truth. That's an attack on his beliefs, his understanding, his commitments, his, what he accepts. It's an attack on him, not on the world. It doesn't say the world has no truth in it. It says he is making a mistake in thinking about the world. And the reason what he's doing is a mistake is because the world really has ice in it. It really does. And that's true, and he's not getting it. That's why it's a mistake. So when I criticize him, I'm criticizing him on the grounds that there is a truth, and he hasn't got it. That's not an attack on truth. That's using truth to point out that people can misunderstand things and come to wrong conclusions on the basis of the narrowness of their experience. That's not an attack on truth. It's just an attack on people who think they have the truth. That's a big difference. In philosophy, it's metaphysics versus epistemology. For those who know those terminologies, those are the two realms. Yeah? Is it the job, then, of the also the objective as to when it comes to truth, to justify truth existing as a whole, as a, you know, compared to that of, let's say, someone who's, or rather to someone who's a skeptic, who may not necessarily just think truth is relative, but deny the existence of, of, of things being true. But then they're like, what does that even mean to be true? Well, I, first of all, as a, as a council of responsibility in your cognitive life, you should test what you believe. And the way they put it is, intersubjectivity is one of the strongest Tests for truth, not always correct, but you test it against what, what other people what other people believe. But um, <clears throat> I mean, the person who says he doesn't believe in truth, I think you have to ask him these questions and say, what do you have to say about these questions? And if he can't answer you and he can't deal with it, he say, well, I think you need to think again because. These questions should instruct you that there's another way of, of looking at things and, and thinking about things. Um, some have pointed out that the idea of belief, to believe something, to believe it is to believe that it's true. There's nothing short of that called believing it. You know, I believe that my keys are in my pocket, but if you say they're not in my pocket, you're just as right as I am. You can't have that. In fact, what was Moore's uh, par pragmatic paradox? Um, yeah, somebody says, it's raining, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? It's raining, but I don't believe it. <laughs> now, look what's happening here. It is possible that it's raining, and it's possible that I don't believe it. That often happens, right? I'm wrong about the weather. That can certainly happen. But I can't say. It's raining and I don't believe it. Because to say it's raining is to express my belief that it is raining. And then I can't say that I don't believe it. That's called a pragmatic paradox because I didn't say I believe it, but saying that it's raining is an expression of that belief. And then to say that I don't believe it, I'm contradicting myself in some pragmatic sense. This is one of G. Moore's uh, discoveries. So the idea of, of saying something is, the idea of believing something is to believe that it is true, is a true description of the way the world is. If, 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 if you try to detach truth from belief, then the belief has no content. So the idea of belief has truth built into it. You want to say something? Yeah. yeah. Um, just a question. So we believe that there is relative truth and there is objective truth. And then can, we, can you summarize just how we, the, the quick arguments for why there is? Relative truth and objective truth? 
Well, I, 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 let me try to summarize what I'm saying. First of all, I think, I didn't say this before, but it's, I think I should mention it. When you say objective truth, the word objective is, is redundant. It isn't as if that there's some truth that's objective and some truth that isn't objective. Truth is the way the world is, and the way the world is the way it is. So it's not a question of, um, the, objectivity is built into the idea of truth. It doesn't matter based on our perceptions. Regardless of what we, based on our environment, that's still the, the world will still be that way. Regardless of imagine, what imagine to think about before there were human beings altogether. Was it true that the Earth was the third planet from the sun? Was it true that there was vegetation? You know, these things don't, don't depend upon us. They're not dependent upon us. If there never were any people and no one ever evolved to have knowledge, still the world had vegetation in it. It has nothing to do with us. Truth is how the world is independent of us. Um, and then I, 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 I'm denying the, that the idea that relative truth makes any sense at all. True for him, but not true for her, makes no sense. The words, the words true there don't, don't function the way they're, way they're supposed to. And you can't, you can't make sense of it. It's relative. Instead of truth, it's relative. When you, well, it isn't relative. Truth isn't relative. Yeah, yeah. I, when you, you say something's words. true, it's not like saying something's in motion. And it's not like saying something is uh, taller. You can challenge a person's statement that something is true without further qualification. It's true that I was in Miami last week. See, relative to relative to what? I said it. It's already said what I said, and it can either be correct or incorrect. It's not. I don't need to fill it in with something else to make it into a statement. Not like John is taller. If I stop, John is taller. I haven't said anything yet. Taller. Taller than what? If I don't say than what, I haven't said anything. And I say I was in Miami last week. I've said something. Doesn't need further filling in to make it into a statement that says something. I've already said something. Similarly, when I say that uh, something's in motion, you stop and just say something's in motion. You haven't said anything yet because you've got to tell me moving with respect to what. If you don't tell me that, you haven't said anything that I can that I can evaluate. But I was in Miami last week. It's already something you can evaluate. You can prove that it's either true or false. Usually, checking the airline records and so forth and so on. So it's not relative at all. Yeah. Um, just going back to something you said a few weeks ago that relates to this. That I thought you, you, at least, how do you square the traditions there, though, almost? You've mentioned before how before human beings existed, we could still say certain propositions are true. But I thought you also mentioned that the, the uh, validity of these propositions are reliant upon a mind. You know, you mentioned before you gave a, the argument that in regards to nominalism and a type of truth had to be dependent on mind. They could use it. One of the, you know what you're talking about? I'm you're, not. You're referring to I'm mind in the world? It was, it was the categories, the numbers. That's right. That was categories that are linked together in experience. And the fact that the linkages, regularities in experience, are regularities of uh, items that fit my categories means that the world is set up with categories. And, that, and categories are, are a, a tool of a mind. So that I'd say you see the activity of a mind in nature that way. Mm, I see. So you weren't saying that. I was just in nominalism because uh, categories aren't things in and of themselves. They're only concepts. You I was quoting the Rambam in that, in that respect. You weren't saying that there's propositions in order to be true or false had to be dependent on a mind. Well, order for those to be no, true. no. They certainly don't depend upon a mind. But in, in a basic sense, we are understanding truth as uh, something that uh, has, uh, it's like a fact. That's the way to understand truth, fact. You could say it's a fact, yeah. Because, I mean, perhaps thinking of it, what uh, Blake was saying, that uh, since, since that through science history, we've seen constantly how we apply certain um, theories that seem to be truth, and they were very, very good and useful and so on. And eventually there was something that broke into those categories and it's just like ah, so the way we understood it even if it worked it wasn't true right so now think what you're saying just take what you just said very seriously we had theories we used them they were useful for certain purposes something came along which they couldn't handle broke them and then we saw that they weren't true your words believe in truth 
Your words are using truth. Your words are, are, are proposing truth. You're not attacking truth, you're using it. You can't say what you said without having a concept of truth. You're agreeing that there's truth. You're not attacking truth. Yeah, but I, I, yes, yes, absolutely. All you have it from that is be careful because you might not have the truth. Yeah. You might think you have the truth, you might not have the truth. Not that there isn't the truth. Not that it's relative. Truth is not relative. We now know that those things were wrong. Newton said that light travels instantaneously. We know that's wrong. We know it travels at a certain speed. He was wrong, because he had it wrong. The truth is that it travels at a certain speed. That's not an attack on truth. It's just, it's just a caution to be careful about thinking you know that you have the truth. That's all. So, I mean, I don't know if, uh, like, I, I learned about a certain way to understand the aletheia and how that kind of seems to apply very well in the scientific uh, realm. What does? The aletheia, the concept of the Greek truth, aletheia, how there was a previous truth that now that it seemed to be working and then suddenly you can no longer apply those categories because they will, they collapse, so then you reach a new one and then you create, you, it's like some sort of the, the source of the belief that people grasp something that seems to be true and then again falls. Like it's, it's like a well, it's not a question of like, you know, tree rings. Uh, the things that caused the thing to the theory to collapse were always there. They didn't come new. Yeah. <laughs> well, didn't change. They were always there. They didn't have the instrumentation to to, to observe them, uh, the, or monitor them. They didn't have the correct description of them. But there, there are things that they do, which uh, like a double slit experiment. If they had tried that, they would have. Had the, they just didn't try it. They couldn't. They didn't have the the thought to, to make do the experiment. The experiment would have held, would have, would have had the same results a thousand years ago, but it just wasn't done. So we're not now talking about the world changing. We're talking about the fact that we had a theory, it worked with a certain amount of the world, and it seemed to work well. We thought it describes the whole of the world. It turns out it doesn't describe the whole of the world and doesn't actually correctly describe the part that we were working with either. But it was too fine a distinction for us to be able to measure. But all of that depends upon there being such a thing as truth. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. so with the invention of technology, does that help us arrive at the conclusion of truths that existed, that have always existed, and we just haven't figured them out yet? Of course. Of course. We say, for example, that, um, you know, let's not talk about sophisticated technology. Let's talk about leading people when they have a fever, which was medical practice until about 150 years ago. Universal medical practice. What do we do with blood? Sorry? What do we do with that when they had a fever? They bled them. They, they took blood from the body. Okay. Either they used leeches or they used suction cups, and they reduced the blood supply in the body. Mm -hmm. They thought that would be good for fevers. We don't do that anymore. We don't think people changed or blood changed. We feel we had a wrong understanding of how the body works. We have a wrong understanding of what fevers are. We now know better that even then, had they not done it, people would have been better off. They made a mistake. They were actually injuring people. That's not an attack on truth. That's just we had the wrong, uh, wrong understanding of what's going on. With technology, you have opportunities that you didn't have before. That doesn't re just, I don't know if that changes the, uh, the thing at all or not. Yeah. So th this is two different questions, but they go together. So first of all, one thing I've heard argued is that everyone sees color slightly different. Like our eyes, like how the colors in Ryan's world, we all see, you know, shades slightly differently. So the way that you see red is different than how I see red, and everyone sees, you know, red maybe slightly differently. So where would the the objective truth be? Though isn't everything relative? And then second, um, some languages and cultures they don't have a word for every single color that you know that we have in English. So like for example, in the Odyssey, Homer call, calls the ocean purple because there is no color, there's no word for the color, you know, blue that we would now call the ocean. So is Homer wrong to call the ocean purple or is the objective fact that the ocean is purple because there is no concept of blue? I, I don't follow either, either remark as, as, as having any content. Um, some people prefer chocolate to vanilla and some people prefer to, uh, vanilla to chocolate. So. What happens to true? Does true play any role here? If you're going to say vanilla is better than chocolate, as if that were a fact, then maybe you'd be in trouble. But no, no intelligent person says that. 
What he says is, I like vanilla better than chocolate. The other people like chocolate better than vanilla, which are facts. They are objective facts. And you could be, and the proof that they're objective facts, you could lie about it. Somebody's only chocolate, they say, I happen to like chocolate, you know, and say that. And you're lying because you don't want the other person to feel bad, but you know it's a lie. So these are objective facts. Now, seeing it differently, first of all, they don't know that. All they know is that it has a certain difference in the way the brain is affected, but they don't know how the brain compensates. No one knows how the brain works. And experience may not be in the brain. So all of that, that's just, just, uh, just uh, uh, loose talk. But let's suppose it is. What's it got to do with truth? I, do, I see red differently than the way you see red. But neither of us says that the, that the top traffic light is, uh, is blue. We've learned that how we interact with that thing is called red. And we trust our sensation of it to be able to identify which things are red. And we will identify exactly the same things as red. The fact that it affects me differently doesn't, check, doesn't affect what I say about the world. So what if it affects me differently? Right? Well, I'd say... Uh, because of a right-handed person, a left-handed person, so the theory of driving a car can't be the same. Because one person uses the right hand more often, the other person uses the left hand more often. What's the got to do with driving the car? Either the car goes straight or it doesn't go straight. This guy uses his right hand more, the guy uses his left hand more. So what? So the fact that internally the experience may be different has nothing to do with what the world is like. When I talk about red, I'm talking about the world. I'm not talking about what I feel. I'm talking about the world. That's one thing. And then uh, you make do with the words that you have which doesn't mean, contrary to what they thought in the 80s and 70s, that you see the world that way. Uh, uh, we have a word in Hebrew which sometimes means green, sometimes means yellow. Um, and that doesn't mean they didn't see the difference between green and yellow. Who says that everything that you experience is mirrored in language? Your language do do doesn't come clear, close to the discriminations that you make. In, in, in What you would have to ask is, take a green thing and a yellow thing and ask them, are they the same color? Let's say they have one word for both. No, of course not. They're not the same color. My words, call them, uh, I call them the same word, but not the same color, would be sort of like having one word for, do for, for, do do for dogs and wolves. And you say, well, then they can't see the difference between dogs and wolves? I don't think that's right. Why not? You know, dogs are, are typically tame. Wolves are wild. They have different behaviors. Right? They hunt in packs. Dogs don't hunt in packs. Right? It's just to have one word for the, for the, whole, the whole thing. So I don't think that, uh, that uh, tracing it from the words is, is, uh, is a good way to um, articulate the experience that you have. You have to ask more sophisticated questions than just, what words do you have? And even that turns out to be anthropologically not true, but let's leave that aside. Yeah? When the object is set, our ability to perceive the object might be flawed and to complicate the problem we might suffer from personal flaws, right? So I might be seeing a flaw in the, the color red that he doesn't necessarily see, but he has a flaw of his own. This is a swerve, but when Adam and Eve ate from the tree in the Garden of Eden, did they reduce their ability to perceive like the true object? And so a lot of these like flaws that we're dealing with, whether it's relativity or the fact that like when we're working on understanding reality, we have to work through successive stages of better theories. These are all like, like the voluntary handicaps and perceiving that we put upon ourselves. I think there, there's something like that that's going on in the Garden of Eden, but I think you're exaggerating. You know, if uh, really each person comes with his own abilities and he comes with his own background and his uh, senses are flawed, how do we all drive on the highway? It's too fast. He's going too slow. He's turning left, not right, because my right eye is slower than my left eye, and, and my, my, my muscles are different. How do we all drive on the highway? How do we sign contracts? How do we, how do we build things and get the same reliable results? This idea that we're all prisoners of a totally subjective uh, uh, point of view to the world, and we differ in ways that we can't get control and can't observe and can't describe, is grossly, grossly exaggerated. It's good enough, but it was better. No, in that case, they lost something in particular. They lost something in particular. You know what it would be like? It would be like losing color vision. You lost color vision, you would be handicapped in a certain way. You could do a lot of the things you could do before, but some of the things would be, would be very difficult to do. Right? They lost Emerson Shecker, they got Tovara instead, which are inferior concepts to replace, play the same role, but in an inferior way. They lost a certain clarity that they had before. That, that's, that's definitely true. And that affected not only their, uh, the, the loss of the concept meant the loss of the perception in that case. It, it definitely did. Well, okay, you know, there are, there are 
dogs that can hear pitches that we can't hear. Okay, so we're handicapped in that way. So what? So what? Well, what's that supposed to follow from that? Different people can hear different pitches. Ten different people's hearing has different acuity. So what? Do we talk to one another to make ourselves understood to one another? Can we listen to, to films and, and, and appreciate them? So uh, the difference is don't somehow cripple us in our ability to deal with the world or deal with, or deal with uh, you know. So why should I take it so seriously? It's, it's philosophically, truth is in trouble because we see things different, uh, differently. It's in trouble. I just think it's harder to get. Okay, but I said that at the beginning. I said, to say it's harder to get presumes there's an it to get. Yes. And that's not an attack on truth. Oh, I wasn't yelling. Okay, yeah. Is human death a fact? Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. I, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because like, we, believe in, we believe in the revivication of the dead. What's up, stop. And therefore, in the meantime, there. Well, there is death for sure. Okay, but okay, but uh, all right. You asked, is it a fact? It's a, it is a fact. You yourself are me agreeing that it's a fact, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. I, fine. I hope so. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Um, I guess just afterwards, like you die, but then you're revived. Yeah. Right. But in the meantime, you're dead. <laughs> okay. So death. That's what so it says, right? This doesn't Not go against death. It certainly doesn't. But now you have to understand what death is. From our point of view, death is the, the separating of the soul and the body. The body ceases to function. The soul is not injured thereby. And the soul is kept in a certain uh, waiting state, waiting for re a reuniting, you know, reuniting with the body. But that's our definition of death, and it's definitely a reality. Other people won't agree with our definition of death. Okay, But, but death, that there is death. No one denies that. People will disagree with how we actually interpret it, but death, regardless of what religion. That's right. Fact. That's right. It's a little bit like experience. Some people think experience is what the brain does. Other people think that's nuts. I agree it's nuts. And there are very, very good people in philosophy who think that it's nuts. Uh, there is a collection that came out now about, I guess about eight years ago, called The Waning of Materialism from Oxford University Press, 29 leading philosophers against the world being only physical, including experience not being physical. And the two biggest proponents of this idea weren't included, Thomas Nagel and, and David Chalmers, who are heroes of the idea that the world isn't only physical, in particular experience is not physical. So there's a lot of critique of that idea um, in philosophical terms. Some people who think that that's the cutting edge is, is about 20 years out of date. Daniel Bennett's wrong? Oh. He's not even wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Daniel's not even wrong. Darwin's dangerous idea. <laughs> yeah. Is, is a fact the same thing as knowledge? No. There are many, many, many facts that people don't know. That's one of the things you do when you're hmm. looking at the world is to search for facts which aren't known yet, like causes of cancer and things like that. There's definitely a fact there. We don't know it. And there are facts that are lost. If you believe in evolution, which I don't recommend, then you think there was a first cell. Now, that first cell was either in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. I think that fact is lost. I don't think it's possible to recover that fact. Nothing we could do today would reveal to us which hemisphere the first cell appeared in. But it's a fact. And there are facts about mathematics, which we certainly don't know, we may never know, because there's an infinity of facts to know. So there are definitely facts that we don't know. Facts is, is about as a feature of the world, and knowledge is a feature of our understanding of the world. That's the dis distinction between metaphysics and epistemology. Metaphysics is what's out there. Epistemology is what I know about what's out there. Those two things are really quite uh, distinct. Well, we didn't get to ethics. <laughs> Notice that. Yeah. So is Judaism the objective fact throughout time and geography then that everything else is relative to? Is the Torah, sorry, is, tor is the, the Torah? The Torah is full of objective facts, but I don't think relative to time and geography. No, I'm saying uh, that everything in time and geography is relative to. You mean Judaism would be the standard that everything else is relative to? Yes. Um, 
I don't know, two plus two is four, isn't relative to Judaism, isn't relative to anything. It just is. The sun is the major source of light for the planet Earth is a fact, and it's not relative to Judaism. Judaism can explain why it's so and how it came to be so, but the fact that it is so isn't relative to Judaism. Not everything has to lean on Judaism for its status. You can say that we understand that God created everything that there is, but, to quote the Ramchal a little bit, <clears throat> but he created it and it is. Of course, creation requires means. Okay, we're talking about the fact. The fact is so, uh, doesn't really need certification from Judaism. Maybe that God is making it so, but doesn't, doesn't need certification for Judaism. We're crossing, we're crossing categories out. Well, anyway, I hope that people, the common politics of truth is at least now weakened beyond what, uh, what uh, it was before. The other thing that I wanted to do with ethics was to put the burden of proof that we spoke about last week on the person who believes that ethics is relative and see how good a job he can do. I think he can't do the job at all. And then to explain why there's reason to think that ethics uh, is not relevant. Uh, but maybe I'll do that next Sunday. Wednesday night I have a class that I have to go to. Maybe I'll do it next Sunday and uh, to say a continuation of this. Okay. 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 Okay.